Hello. So now we are going to have our transportation in a post-COVID society panel. Um, please give a warm welcome to Arik Ohana, the CEO and founder of Envoy. Arik, take it away. Please introduce the panelists. Hi, everyone. Uh, I guess we'll give it a second for everybody else to join. There we go. All right, so I think we're waiting for two more of our panelists um, before we get started. There's Peter. Give Phil one minute. And then um, Phil is on the stage. Phil, if you can turn on your microphone and camera, you'll join everybody on stage. Thanks, Lauren. Well, I will say, you know, after six months of working from home and doing these virtual conferences, uh, this Remo platform is actually really interesting. It feels, uh, I heard somebody else say, it feels like SimCity um, or real Sims. So. The intro, uh, and hopefully Phil will join us in a second. Um, so this discussion is going to be revolving around the impacts we've seen in the transportation sector uh, due to COVID. Um, and obviously, uh, there's been a lot of impacts throughout the world, but uh, in transportation sector, uh, what we want to focus on is really a discussion on the impact we've seen on our operations, uh, but also the impacts on the consumer of these mobility services, the different trends we're seeing. Uh, we, we all understand, uh, especially this time, transportation is an essential service. Uh, you know, it's, it's how we're getting medicine, groceries, everything else. Uh, around our lives. So this is a really important topic. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to just quickly intro everybody that's on the panel, and then I'll allow each one of them to uh, take a few minutes to just tell us a little bit more about themselves. Uh, so we are with Phil Washington. Uh, he's the CEO of Metro. But we do have Stephanie Wiggins, who is the CEO of Metrolink. Uh, Peter Lee, uh, the CEO and co-founder of Urbi. Ur Urbi. Uh, and Tamika Butler, the principal and founder of Tamika L. Butler Consulting. Um, so while we wait for Phil, uh, Stephanie, do you mind taking a few minutes to just telling us a little bit about uh, you and your role at MetroLink? Sure. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephanie Wiggins. I'm the CEO of MetroLink. And uh, as it relates to operations and COVID, you know, our system has... Um, not unlike any across the nation, witnessed the significant ridership decline. Our uh, ridership decline at, a, at its lowest was 90% below uh, what we normally average. Um, today, we're about at 81%. So we're still you know, sluggish and, and, and struggling. And for us, over these last six months, um, what I've been sharing is it's a realization that this pandemic is more than just a crisis. It's really a major disruption. And it's an opportunity for us to look at the way we deliver our services. Um, and our board just recently, actually last week, formally adopted our recovery plan, which you know focuses on health and safety, that's foundational. But also um, we have a pillar called uh, the triple bottom line of environment, economy, and equity because it's really an opportunity for us to shift the way we approach uh, delivering the services. Uh, what has illuminated for us um, during the last six months is that while, um, you know, no surprise, the majority of our ridership had that type of a role where they could work remotely, there's still 10% uh, of our riders who are essential workers. And we started talking to the essential, uh, essential workers who are riding our system, what we found um, was that 39% of them work in the healthcare industry. 
but we had really never focused on uh, essential services in particular uh, and marketing our services to um, those industries. And we did a deeper dive on the healthcare industry and there are over 600 healthcare facilities within five miles of a station. So it's allowed us to really refocus um, the importance of these essential industries and providing this much needed service for essential workers. About a third of our riders who continue to ride say they don't have access to a car. Um, further, it's an opportunity for us to uplift uh, partnerships with micro mobility and active transportation. Um, we just celebrated, you know, car free day last week, bike to work. It's a way to elevate those types of partnerships. So we're trying to leverage this opportunity to really um, come out of this safer at home environment, smarter, better, and more essential, and really look at the value proposition that we're providing the community that we serve. And of course, uh, it couldn't be power day without me making a plug for environment and it's doubling down on our approach to accelerate our zero emission future. Um, we retired our um, last 100% polluting diesel locomotive during this pandemic. We're a few weeks away from having two thirds of our fleet operate with the cleanest diesel technology that's available right now. It cuts down the greenhouse gas emissions from 85%, uh, 65%, depending on the conversion. And of course, we're looking at hydrogen fuel cell. We partnered with um, uh, Phil Washington and LA Metro on a grant at the state level. We are fortunate to get a grant that allows us to look at other alternative fuel technology for our system, including hydrogen fuel. So that's just a little bit about what's been going on at Metrolink and how we've been trying to adapt to really how the world has turned upside down. Thanks, Stephanie. Definitely want to dig in a few of the things that you were talking about on the impacts of your operation. Uh, before, uh, Peter, do you want to do a quick introduction of yourself and your company? Right. Um, so my name is Peter. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Irby. Irby stands for Urban Electric, and we uh, deliver a platform of um, interchangeable electric mobility solutions for delivery companies. Uh, so during this time, we've been really focused on working with enterprise, uh, large companies like Amazon and UPS to help them increase their capacity for last mile delivery. And um, uh, so we've seen it, you know, we've been in this for uh, about five years, but in the last couple of years, we've been really focusing on building a uh, swappable, interchangeable platform for, um, uh, last last mile delivery solutions, and um, especially with helping now that people are increasing their um, purchases online uh, for groceries and all these new things that are happening, the demand for for this uh, type of service has increased enormously, and um, so we've been just working very hard to keep up with the demand, and we're launching a a program with, with Amazon in New York uh, next week. So we're very excited about that. That's great, Peter. Thank you. Uh, Tamika, uh, if you don't mind, love to hear from you. Sure. Um, happy to be here. Happy to be uh, with this great panel. So um, thanks for having us, Lacey. Um, so my name is Tamika. And my most recent job was a, a tool design, a private transportation consulting firm focused on active transportation, where I was the director of equity and inclusion and the California planning director. In July, I, I started my own consulting practice. And I would I would say that's one of the main um, things that's happened for me as a result of this pandemic is somebody who has been talking about transportation equity for years. I think all of a sudden the demand um, became much higher, right? As, as we started to focus on essential workers and as there started to be this acknowledgement um, that black and brown folks were dying at a higher rate um, and were also more likely to be um, our transit riders, were also more likely to be our essential workers. Um, all of a sudden, I think folks who previously said, um, we, we don't have time for this equity thing, all of a sudden realized it was also essential. Um, and, it, and it turned um, out that, you know, I've just been completely busy. 
And I think there are a lot of folks in, in the private consulting space who have been focusing on transportation equity for a really long time. Um, I heard a colleague um, from Canada, actually, um, her name is Jay Pitter, and she recently publicly spoke and said, you know, if you weren't reaching out to me before all of this, I can't answer your call because I, I'm not interested, you know, in things that are kind of in this moment, let's have a, a, a lunch talk, right? I think the overlap of, of the racial uprisings um, and, and COVID has made a lot of people say we have to do something around equity, whether or not it's a statement, whether or not it's, it's a luncheon. And, and I think now more than ever, um, Stephanie said it best, this is a disruption that allows us to do things differently, not get back to normal, but completely reimagine um, how we prioritize, how we fund, how we move, um, and the things we do related to public transportation. And, and I think that's something um, that, you know, many folks say, well, we have to use this opportunity, we have to use this opportunity. I, I think we have to get past thinking about things opportunistically and, and really start thinking about things transformatively. Yeah, Tamika, thank you. Uh, and I think th that is an important topic uh, that we should touch on, uh, equity side of mobility. As a quick intro, um, you know, I'm the CEO of a company called Envoy. Uh, we are an all electric car sharing company. Uh, we partner with large real estate owners to provide um, what we call mobility as an amenity. So electric vehicles that are on site that are shared amongst neighbors. Um, and, you know, we have a big focus on, uh, you know, equity and just enabling uh, you know, disadvantaged communities and lower income communities to access electric vehicles are typically uh, the later adopter to technology. Uh, so enabling and getting those vehicles in their hands, we, we find very, very important. We've seen on those communities where those vehicles are parked. Um, so again, thank you all for joining us. Uh, Stephanie, you know, uh, you know, you touched on it, but if you could, what can you uh, just dig a little deeper on the impacts of the operation, not on the, you know, just the reduction in ridership, but what did you guys have to change in regards to keeping uh, your passengers safer uh, during this period of time, moving them around? Sure. Well, immediately we started increasing the type of cleaning, touch point cleaning more frequently. Um, we now spent, I think, over half a million dollars in enhanced cleaning. Um, we changed our approach um, to using disinfectants. We wanted to make sure we also communicated with our riders about this. It was really important to stay connected. When you lose 90% of your customer base every day, uh, we really were fortunate that we had already developed a communication infrastructure that's technology based so that we could still connect with them. And so uh, we changed our approach to communicating with them. It wasn't just about the service, but about uh, their safety and security concerns. So that was critical. Um, and not only have we, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to ask, has there been any kind of new technology that you've seen come to the forefront during this pandemic? help you with uh, the, those efforts in regards to keeping people safe? Um, sure. Well, almost from the beginning, we started using this new fogging technology, this technique um, that you see on the airplanes to really disinfect a large area in a, in a very effective way. And it was important to implement that technology as part of our cleaning regimen and our cleaning protocols. And it really has increased the level of confidence from both our riders and those who said, okay, now that I see that you do that, when I'm ready to ride or have a reason to ride, I'll feel more comfortable riding. That was critical. The other thing that we had to do is be innovative and leverage the data that we had. So one of the tools that we're seeing that has been helpful, and again, increasing that confidence uh, of potential riders is letting them know about social distancing and what type of crowding exists on the train. So we leverage the data that we already used internally for decision-making purposes and just use technology to make that available to the writing public. And so our favorite tool, it's called How Full Is My Train, literally. And you go in and it could tell you how what the uh, loading capacity has been. So you can make a decision and feel empowered as to whether or not you want to take that train or, or work on a later train. So those are just some of the ways that we it's impacted our service. But we we have shifted our offerings. Um, we are more 
in alignment with the community that we serve and what are their needs, especially with the economic downturn. So we launched a few weeks ago, Kids Write Free on Weekends, recognizing that parents are looking for something to do, get out of the house, and this is a safe way to travel and to uh, get to outdoor activities. We've launched a telecommuting pass be more flexible. Not everyone, I think the five day in office work week is dead. And so we need to make sure we offer a product that works for the flexibility that people need with their changing commute patterns. Excellent. Uh, well, it looks like Phil uh, just joined us. Hi, Phil, how are you? You might be on mute, by the way. Uh, I'm good, how you doing? I had some problems getting in. I think it nope. was uh, my assistant's fault, but whatever. <laughs> Usually. Uh, well, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, Phil is the CEO of Metro. Uh, before you got on, Phil, everybody did a quick intro. Um, you know, if you don't mind, just give us a few minutes of a uh, quick intro. And we'd love, we're actually talking about, you know, the impacts on the operations uh, that Stephanie's seen. Uh, but we love the, and she just touched on kind of, uh, you know, free uh, ridership. And I know you have a big push for the fareless ride. So if you could just take a minute and, a quick introduction. Uh, yes, I'm uh, Philip Washington, uh, the CEO of LA Metro, and uh, happy to, to join the conversation with this distinguished panel. Thank you. Um, and, and kind of just jumping right into it, uh, could you talk to us about some of the efforts Metro has for zero emission losses and, and other uh, work you're doing in space right now? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, and thank you for having me as well. Uh, in 2017, the Metro Board uh, unanimously uh, adopted a motion uh, endorsing uh, a, a comprehensive plan to transition from um, or to 100% uh, zero emission bus fleet by 2030. Uh, and we would be the largest uh, transit agency in America uh, to endorse such a goal. So our plan is to transition to electric buses. Um, and it's really contingent in my mind on two things. One is the continued technological uh, advances in the electric bus and electric bus technology. And that includes uh, range, that includes reduction of charging uh, times, uh, extension of battery life cycles and uh, a drop in price uh, as the technology develops. Uh, one of my concerns has been, quite honestly, that uh, our goal, uh, it is very, very ambitious, um, uh, but we're the only ones out there saying 2030. Now, that's both good and bad, right? Because um, it's good because we want to be on the leading edge. Um, it's bad because I don't want to be on the bleeding edge. Uh, and and with when you talk about uh, an ambitious date of 2030, uh, when other folks around the country may be at 2040 or 2050, uh, then the price per unit is likely not to go down. Uh, until there are economies of scale uh, in terms of purchasing um, buses. Uh, I had a conversation uh, not long ago uh, with the president of the Chicago Transit um, Authority, uh, Dorval Carter uh, in Chicago. And I, you know, I told him, I asked him, well, when are you guys going electric? He said, Phil, uh, don't even talk to me about that. It's gonna be 2040 or 2050. Well, what that does for us is keep that price uh, higher uh, than, than it would be if other large transit agencies were to purchase around the same time frame. So that is, that's gonna be an issue. Um, you know, the unit price uh, of let's say a 60 footer uh, is what, uh, maybe around 1.2 million a pop. Uh, and so, uh, we would be the largest uh, American transportation agency to endorse. We have been the largest to endorse this uh, ambitious goal uh, for converting 100% of our fleet, and it's great. 
uh, and our board has been very committed to this, but at the same time, it's my job to, in this case, speak truth to power uh, and, and to say uh, that uh, there is going to be a price to pay, um, you know, for early um, uh, conversion. Uh, and I'll say just one other thing, um, uh, you know, right now uh, we've adopted uh, four zero emission electric buses on the G line, which is the old orange line. Uh, and we plan to have that entire line done by the end of this year. So we're being very, very aggressive uh, in our approach. Uh, and that is gonna be 40 buses just on that G line, the old orange line. Uh, and we're also looking at what we can do on the silver line uh, by the end of 2021. So we are moving forward. We got uh, buses on order, but I think I think we should go into this with our eyes wide open, right? Our eyes wide open in terms of you know if we're going to be on the leading edge, that this is um, uh, you know this is what we're going to be faced with. Yeah. I'm sure you mentioned the cost of an electric bus at 1.2 million, um, and I'm sure that's two to three times more than you know current ICE vehicles. Um, and I'm assuming the infrastructure that has to go in to charge those buses. Uh, how, how do you guys? How are you looking at that? Is that going to be more of depot? Uh, are you looking at in-ground uh, electric conduits running to power the buses? What are you, what are you guys looking at there? Um, well, I mean, you know, we're we're looking at. Um charging stations in North Hollywood, uh, Canoga, uh, Chatsworth uh, to uh, enable the buses to remain in service without having to return to the divisions uh, to be recharged. And so they're overhead uh, and it's, it's pretty slick. Um, you know, uh, it can, the bus charge can be quickly topped off when needed, remain in active revenue service. Uh, we got a chance uh, to see this uh, when we uh, commissioned the first electric bus probably about a month ago. Uh, myself and Chair Garcetti went out and and uh, our folks charged um, the, the bus right there as we were standing there. Um, and it, uh, it was put in service uh, probably about 10, 15 minutes later. So we will have these charging stations at those three locations in order to keep the bus in service. So it's... Um, um, I, I don't think passengers will notice, you know, the charging. I mean, it goes overhead and you talk quiet. I mean, these, these things are uh, incredible. And this is uh, undoubtedly where we want to be. And I think where the industry will be, uh, we just have to get there um, in, in a financially prudent manner, I believe. Excellent. Uh, Tamika, you know, you, you actually mentioned, uh, you know, this disruption of COVID is an opportunity to create change. You know, what projects or what have you been seeing that is getting you excited about the change in uh, equitable transportation? I mean, it's it's tough, right? Because I, I think what I keep talking about as much as things are changing, there are some things that remain the same. Um, so, you know, to not be overtly political, I think I'm a black person that lives in America. <laughs> so when when there are, you know, debates and things happening where on the national scale, we're still saying that we can't even have trainings um, about racism um, because there's a risk that it may be a, too much of a role reversal for white folks. I think that makes me worry that for some folks, this is just a moment. This is just the special moment where the pandemic and the continued killing of black folks and folks are a captive audience that they're saying they care. And so I think I, I hold that tension, but I also hold that tension with the fact that there are more leaders of organizations. And I think, you know, Phil and Stephanie are definitely a part of that group that are making these bold strides, right? Like they're not just watching and seeing um, wildfires and climate change and racial injustices um, and this pandemic um, and saying, what do we do? They're actually putting things into action and they're actually making um, strides. And so I think there is some hope and some optimism and the fact that more folks are beyond just talking about this work, they're investing in it. 
And I think, I think, you know, with Phil's conversation about um, electrifying vehicles, it's, it's so true, whether or not you're talking about electrifying vehicles, whether or not you're talking about investing um, and, and fighting um, anti-blackness and racism, these things cost more than we often think, and they also take longer, right? I think sometimes people want the instant gratification of seeing some of these 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 um, investments pay off instantaneously. And so I think part of my hope and optimism is in bold leadership who's saying, we're gonna make strategic hires, we're gonna invest in these resources, we're gonna invest in these programs, and we know that we're gonna have folks at us because they're not seeing the immediate changes, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. And it doesn't mean that we shouldn't make these investments. And the last thing I'll say is I think there is starting to be a shift, not as big as we would hope, but there is starting to be a shift around this idea of transit dependent folks. And I think what this pandemic has made us realize is if you are depending on the person to check you out at the grocery store, if you are depending on the doctor, if you are depending on the person who's cleaning in these public places that you so desperately want to get back to, and they are transit dependent, then we're all transit dependent. And I think there is starting to be a shift in that articulation of who, who do we worry about and who do we not worry about? Because to a certain extent, whether or not you're talking about saving our planet or whether or not you're talking about who's able to show up and do the jobs we need them to do, I think there's this, this acknowledgement that there's more to transit dependency than we initially thought. Yeah, I completely agree on all those points. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where public transit is needed, but there's definitely these areas that public transit just can't. But what we do see happening, what's happening now is a lot, a lot of new technologies from micro mobility to other shared mobility platforms that are kind of filling in those gaps. Um, Peter, I, I know you didn't get a chance to talk yet, but I would love to hear from you on, you know, I think you guys have really focused on the enterprise side of mobility and providing logistical solutions that, uh, you know, can actually replace five ton trucks with little scooters. So can you just on that real quick? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, we actually have a platform of solutions that are interchangeable. They all connect with a proprietary connection and actually a folding system that saves space. One of the things, pain points that we found in, in cities beyond just transportation is in, is in last mile logistics. Is, you know, how do you stay, if you want to scale to deliver to millions of people a day, well, where are the parking lots and the space that you have to start, you know, um, staging or, or or storing these this equipment? And so uh, we, while you look on our website, you see a Ruby scooter type product uh, with a trailer that actually UPS is using in Southern California. But but we've actually developed something kind of in secret over the last year and a half that we'll be rolling out with Amazon in New York. That is a a uh, much different platform. It's a can pull 1,200 pounds. It replaces, you know, what a five-ton truck can do in cities, um, and it folds up and saves probably 70% or more space than current offerings now, including cargo bikes. Um, and one of our focus is not only in saving space so that companies can have the ability to expand and deliver more product, um, but it also allows um, uh, companies, large logistics and delivery companies to utilize their their um, their people more efficiently, especially with social distancing. You just can't have that many people crowded around a certain area. And for the safety of, of delivery associates and employees, we uh, have increased by over three times the efficiency that one individual can do. And that offers a lot more of efficient uh, efficiencies. It increases our capacity per route. Uh, we also increase the proximity that uh, businesses can can be to their customers, so they can do same day delivery. And we, what we, what we've been doing a lot of work in New York because it's so, it's so, um, it's a challenging city to do anything out there with regards to transportation or logistics. You know, we're a LA based company. This is where we are, and we we love. Actually, we actually have a we've had early relationships with Metro and MetroLink. They were early on in 2015 working with when we are consumer facing for commuters and students to uh, uh, adopt a lightweight foldable uh, vehicle that we had developed. 
and we're just you know looking forward especially with the pandemic happening we're looking forward to uh working with la and partners like la and la metro to um la metro and Met metro link to to develop uh um, solutions where people who, who depend on public transportation can utilize our services to, you know, do deliveries, expand and do other things that are entrepreneurial uh, without emitting, um, without increasing congestion and, and pollution. Peter, uh, that was great. And we're really coming up at the end of uh, this event. But before we go, you know, I just wanted to maybe get uh, from Phil and Stephanie uh, their opinion on the need for public stimulus uh, to promote these types of programs like zero emission vehicles. I know uh, Lacey led uh, a stimulus proposal with Metro um, and you know even us as a company you know we, we've uh, gotten great the California Energy Commission Electrify America to deploy vehicles into disadvantaged communities but Phil, uh, Phil take a minute uh, and talk about maybe the stimulus proposal that you and Lacey put together and why you think this is really important for the future of uh, zero emission vehicle adoption. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that the need for public s stimulus and grants and all that is is uh, unbelievably important. Uh, and uh, I think about the federal government. There, there needs to be uh, grant funding uh, that is tied to innovation uh, at the federal level and grants provided to uh, local agencies that are looking to um, innovate and go down this road. Uh, I, I think uh, two things, um, as we, as I heard uh, Tamika uh, and, and Peter uh, talking, two things strike me. Um, one is that uh, the understanding and realization that we are building for actually the next 40 to 50 years. I mean, we're building this infrastructure now and trying to predict what will happen in 30 to 40 or 50 years, because that is how long this infrastructure will be in service, right? Uh, you know, when, you know, last week we took to the LA Metro board, our long range transportation plan uh, that is over a period of 40 years saying we're gonna spend $400 billion uh, during that time period and here is our vision for how we should spend it. So we are forecasting what will occur in the transportation space 40 to 50 years out. That's incredible. Uh, and um, the, the micro mobility that Peter was just talking about, um, you know, we're doing micro transit, we're doing mobility on demand. Uh, we have a transit app that um, that we just unveiled um, that w where people that are waiting on a bus, they can use that app and, and they can determine how crowded that bus is that's on the way to them in terms of social distancing and all of that. So we need public stimulus uh, to help agencies that are trying to think 30, 40, 50 years out. Um, and, uh, and, and so in my mind, there has to be um, sort of a, um, an understanding uh, from our, our federal government and the state uh, that uh, these agencies and identify those agencies are thinking that far out. Because the question becomes, uh, how do we want to live? How do we want to live? Do we want to be in gridlock? for the next 10 years, 15 years? Do we want smog and climate issues for the, how do we want to live? And I do believe that that future is of course technology, uh, but more so that future is fareless transit, uh, which, you know, uh, I'm pushing against. Uh, and by the way, uh, you know, I may need police protection myself uh, from the transit industrial complex that will probably come after me when I start talking about fareless transit. Uh, and that's your manufacturers of fare boxes and TVMs and all of that, right? Um, but I, I do believe that's coming. Uh, and I believe that there uh, should be, must be uh, stimulus and, and funding 
for those that are looking around the corner in this industry 20, 30, 40 years out? Well, unfortunately, uh, we're going to have to wrap it up here. I mean, 30 minutes really goes by fast. I'm, you know, I wish we actually had an hour because I have a lot of questions. Uh, really, thank you all, all the panelists for your time and your contribution to this panel. Uh, it was very enlightening. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And thank yeah. you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thanks for being here today.